Uh, Alicos, thank you for joining us. Trust me, I'm the king of technical difficulties, so I very much sympathize with you. Um, and, and welcome everybody uh, to, I think this is our 13th edition. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll keep this short, um, but we have Alicos, theologist uh, from UCSF, who, um, you know, I know Sig a little bit from skiing, and he's really said great things about you. And I think that this is a, a totally appropriate topic. Um, you know, obviously, we mostly think about the sagittal plane issues and we're doing our deformity surgeries, but to, to kind of spend some time and, and just really dig in on coronal alignment, I think will be very worthwhile, uh, especially for the fellows. And then I just, while I have the, the stage, I want to shamelessly plug um, the Bridging the Gap meeting this July down here in, in Southern California in Carlsbad, which is sort of the official meeting of the West Coast Fellows Conference. And hopefully we'll be able to arrange some specific funding for fellows that, that want to come take advantage of it. So um, Alicos, I'm going to stop sharing. And if you just share your screen, you should be able to start. OK, thanks. Thanks in advance, bud. Yeah, awesome. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak. Sorry for being a little late. No problem. All right. So you guys see this? Yes, we can. OK, great. So all right. So good morning. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I think for the sake of time, we'll just jump right into it. Um, these are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to the talk. So coronal alignment, um, I think the focus on it has waxed and waned over the years. You know, initially with scoliosis surgery, the coronal plane was really the only thing that um, people focused on. Then it swung to the sagittal plane, and that's probably been in vogue for the last, last 10, 15 years. And just seems like in the last five years or so, we've kind of swum pendulum back in the other direction to the coronal plane. Um, and I think the initially, um, there are some debate of whether the coronal plane really matters or not. Um, but, you know, if we go back to Glassman's original article that really uh, showed that the sagittal plane malalignment drove disability. In that paper, the coronal alignment also demonstrated decreased functional outcomes if the um, CSVL was greater than four centimeters. You can see here that pain on the SRS uh, function score was significantly uh, lower. Um, the SF12 scores, ODI, um, were all considerably lower if your coronal malalignment uh, or alignment was greater than four centimeters off. Uh, more recently, like I said, the pendulum has swung. The ISSG has really uh, dug their teeth deeper into this. You can see a lot of familiar face na names here. And um, underlined on the bottom, they concluded that a residual coronal malalignment greater than three centimeters was associated with the worst outcomes, suggesting a potential coronal realignment target threshold to assist surgical planning. So really the goals of surgery um, when it comes to the coronal plane that um, it's most basic are to realign the CSVL to less than three centimeters. But the second point may be a little bit more uh, nuanced and challenging, and that's to keep the shoulders parallel to the horizontal and floor. Um, and in order to achieve both these goals, it's really important to understand the drivers of coronal uh, deformity. And two you know, major categories are intrinsic pathology that can drive coronal malalignment, so intrinsic to the spine, or extr extrinsic pathology. So you have the patients with the leg length discrepancies and these can may be um, independent of each other, but also uh, there could be concomitant deformities and those are probably the most challenging. Um, an example of that would be a lady that uh, you know presents with something like this, who clearly has a extremely short right leg uh, from multiple uh, hip operations. And um, you can see here that if you try to realign the, um, the, the, the spine relative to the sourceals, then you know after surgery, she's going to be tipped off over to the right. So really the goal in this situation is to assess the, you know, the, the realign the spine relative to the, the horizontal. Um, and when we, so that, that's something to consider with leg length discrepancies. If we try to focus on the intrinsic pathology and how to realign the spine, um, there are some classification systems that have been proposed to help guide um, not really the surgical exact 
uh, surgical strategies, but something to keep in mind um, in terms of planning your surgery. So the first classification was by Bow, which was uh, published in the JBGS British, um, and it was a three-part, or it is a three-part classification system, A, B, and C. Um, as you can see here, A is are those patients that have a coronal alignment with a CSVL less than three centimeters. Um, types B and C are those that are quote unquote malaligned greater than three centimeters. And the direction of their trunk shift of malalignment relative to the concavity of the lumbar uh, major curve is what determines B versus C. So the B patients have a coronal malalignment in that's ipsilateral to the concavity of the, uh, the, the, the lumbar scoliosis. If it's type C, it's the opposite. It's where the trunk shift of the malalignment is ipsilateral. Uh, it's, it's, it's contralateral to the concavity. Um, you know, this also was then um, uh, OBIED in 2019, the European Spine Journal broke it down into essentially two categories, those that are concave, as you see on the left, which would be the equivalent of the, of the bow type Bs, um, and the type C patients are the equivalent of a obaid type 2 or convex. And, you know, as you can tell, obaid doesn't take into account the magnitude of deformity, um, but you can see here that the A patients could fall into either category um, it just, this is more qualitative, uh, in the OBIED. Now, OBIED did give us some recommendations for how the deformity should be managed. You can see on the concave, the type ones, the correction should be aimed at the apex of the main curve, whereas in the con convex or the type twos, the correction should be aimed at the lumbosacral junction. Now, I wanted to run by, run through several cases, um, to, uh, exemplify this or, or highlight um, kind of the surgical strategies that can um, help optimize the um, alignment postoperatively. So these are the concave, the OBI type ones or the bow type Bs. The malalignment is ipsilateral to the concavity of the lumbar curve. And really you want to assess the main curve's flexibility. Um, if it is flexible, <clears throat> then you can do uh, post-sarcoma osteotomies or some type of inner body through this area to realign um, ATP direct lateral. I don't think discussing which one is uh, has a greater utility in this situation is uh, necessary. If it is a rigid deformity, um, prior fusion, they have a residual coronal malalignment, you know, three column osteotomy uh, can be performed or an intradiscal osteotomy, which I can show you in, in a case uh, upcoming. The lumbosacral fractional curve in this patient um, population is kind of along for the ride. It's not really the most important thing to um, correct for realigning uh, the coronal plane. You can debate um, approaches and, in, excuse me, anterior, posterior. Um, you know, my preference is to do anterior because I think if you restore the L4 to S1, um, lower doses to about 35, 40 degrees. That helps improve your pelvic tilt and overall provides a better uh, sagittal plane correction. But for the coronal plane uh, approach, I don't think really matters for this patient population. Um, so this is a patient of mine a couple of years ago, this kind of neuromuscular um, deformity, very severe coronal malalignment that's ipsilateral to the concavity of the main lumbar curve. So it's an OBIE type one or a bow type B. Um, so we assess the main curve flexibility. You can see with the, the black um, within the discs, there is some flexibility to this. So I don't think that you need a three column osteotomy. Um, and then, you know, whether you do this from the side and then the back or just the back, um, or you know, anterior and posterior, um, a lot of ways that we could debate that. Um, for him, we ended up doing an anterior and A-lift from L3 to S1. Um, we put structural cages at L4 uh, to S1, and then at L3-4, we did more of a traditional quote-unquote release. So we did the uh, discectomy and then placed morselized allograft chips so that we could, uh, I didn't want to lock that tilt at L3-4 um, to try, which would potentially prevent me from bringing him over all the way. So 
I felt like keeping a little bit looser through the L3-4 segment would help uh, correct the coronal plane. On stage two, we did a T3 of the pelvis with posterior column osteotomies, um, and then we use a kickstand rod on the right side. Uh, that really helped depress the right uh, hemipelvis and uh, help push um, and achieve what we wanted to in the coronal plane. Uh, this is another case of mine that six, 12 months ago, a uh, lady who had a prior uh, L4-5 T-lift um, and not only had a sagittal plane deformity, but presented with this very severe coronal malalignment. Now, in her case, when we look at the CT scan, um, a lot of that deformity is through that one segment at L1-2. Um, so it is more of a rigid deformity. Uh, doesn't really correct on the supine CT scan. Um, so in this case, we were focused more on the rigid um, area and uh, we're planning on doing something that involved uh, something through the anterior column. So for her, uh, we also did an anterior to help more with the coronal, uh, the uh, sagittal plane. Uh, above and below her prior uh, T-lift, we did uh, A-lifts, L3-4 and L5-S1. And then stage two, we also did a T3 to the pelvis. Um, but then instead of doing a three-column osteotomy, we just did an intradiscal osteotomy through that uh, L1-2 segment. So you can see that starred areas, that prior osteophyte. Essentially, we just uh, did passatectomy, um, got into the disc with an osteotome, and then cracked it open. And after doing that, it was very uh, easy to realign um, that segment and uh, horizontalize the uh, L1 and L2 end plates. And that was uh, the final the final construct. We ended up not needing to use a kickstand rod, but we had planned on it um, just by you know, doubling up her iliac screws, uh, but just by correcting that segmental the uh, coronal deformity, we're able to realign her uh, as that appropriately. So moving on to the, the OBIE type twos or the bow type Cs, the convex uh, deformities. These are the ones that are the, the problem children. Um, when I was a fellow at WashU, uh, Manish Gupta and I wrote up a series of Dr. Lanky and Dr. Bridwell's uh, patients, all posterior based operations. And we looked at how patients behaved after surgery um, relative to their preoperative coronal uh, alignment. So the type C patients, you can see here, postoperatively, the type C patients that started pre-op, two thirds of them remained uh, malaligned in the same direction. So stayed type Cs after surgery. And this has been um, corroborated by multiple other studies. Bow's original classification system demonstrated this um, and other other um, groups have also found that these are the ones that are most challenging to correct. Um, these are some pictures from that paper. Um, you can see this is a patient um, um, from WashU, had a pretty sizable deformity. You can see as a type C, uh, bow type C, OBIE type one, uh, excuse me, IB type two, where the coronal malalignment is five centimeters to the right. And then after going nice, you know, relative correction of the mid lumbar curve as well as the lumbosacral fractional curve with a three level T lift, the coronal malalignment got worse uh, in the same direction. This was because there was an imbalance in the correction between the main lumbar curve and the lumbosacral fractional curve. So in this case, the mid lumbar curve, which is usually more flexible than the lumbosacral fractional curve, was corrected relatively more than the lumbosacral fractional curve resulting in this uh, um, worsening of, of the of the alignment. So uh, with these patients, um, the real focus should be on the lumbosacral fractional curve. The lumbar main curve is just along for the ride. So it's the opposite of the uh, the type um, one OBIE to the bio type Bs. So in this case, similar to <clears throat> what we did on the other slides, we looked at the flexibility. So um, if it is flexible, then you can do work through the inner body space um, and posterior column releases. And then if it is rigid, then doing a three column osteotomy usually is necessary. The mid lumbar curve, this is one of the ones you don't wanna to do too much in terms of correction. Um, I would strongly avoid doing structural cages through this area, because that's gonna make your correction from the back significantly harder and may not be able to bring it back over if you do lock it in place. And then these are the patients who are kickstand rod on the convexity side, I think is a, is a necessity 
or at least something that you should have in place that you can then use if your interoperative alignment is not satisfactory. So this is a lady of mine um, from about a year ago. She, we ended up focusing all the correction on that lumbar sacral fractional curve. So we did an L3 to S1 A lift. Again, uh, didn't want to lock in that uh, coronal tilt at 3-4, so we did a release. Discectomy in place, morselized allograph chips within structural cages at 4-5 and 5-1, and then T10 in the pelvis in the back with the right side of kickstand rod. And uh, overall, I think the alignment uh, turned out um, acceptable. Um, this is another patient, now uh, more complicated. You can see She's a very sick woman on TPN, short gut syndrome, who presented with an infection chronically. Um, this very, very severe coronal malalignment. She couldn't stand up because of her uh, pain in the le her legs as well as her back. So we don't have full standing film, but you can get an appreciation for her trunk shift being uh, extremely far to the right. Um, this was a osteo burnt out osteo um, at L5, L6. You know, complicated things by having transitional anatomy. Um, and it was a very rigid deformity. Um, as you can see here on the supine scouts, didn't really uh, correct much. This was her lying on the table again. Her trunk is shifted to uh, the right um, because of how rigid the deformity was. You can see the hip pads. Uh, she, her body couldn't essentially rest uh, midline between the hip pads and the shoulder pads. Um, so her hemi pelvis was, you know, a little bit off the uh, the left side. So in this case, again, the focus should be on that deformity, um, the rigid part of the, of the spine. Um, in this case, you know, we kind of killed two birds with one stone by doing the three column osteotomy um, at L5, L6. We were able to not only correct the deformity or address the deformity, but also address the, uh, it provides some debridement to that anterior column. And the mid lumbar curve, again, no structural cages. She had an underlying idiopathic scoliosis, which um, did complicate things or made it a little bit more tricky to think about for correction. Uh, we plan on the kickstand rod on the right side and convexity. And then um, we actually planned on not correcting the mid lumbar curve deformity as much uh, or go for a home run there because we didn't think that we'd get 100% uh, horizontalization of um, L, L4 to the sacrum. Um, so we wanted to balance the correction of both uh, curves. So this is her postoperatively. Um, I think overall coronal alignment is satisfactory. You can see here that the mid lumbar curve still has a residual curve, but that I think is okay if you put your hand over the spine. If you just look at the hips and the shoulders, um, she she is lined. Now, you can see here that the kickstand rod did a, did wonders for um, helping correct this. You can see where her uh, pelvic obliquity was at the beginning of the case at the top, and then afterwards by pushing down the helmet pelvis, uh, really depressing that right, uh, the right side, that was able to help uh, with our overall coronal, uh, coronal alignment. Now, I just wanted to give a couple thoughts on the bow type A's. These are the ones that are not malaligned. Um, they have less than three centimeters, but they can actually be a little tricky. And I think it's important to understand where the, the pitfalls can be. So in the series that we had, um, even though 80% of the patients stayed type A's after surgery, so they stayed aligned, there were about 20% of the patients that became malaligned um, and they became type C's. And um, so this is an example from the paper patient started with less than three centimeters, um, but afterwards became significantly coronally malaligned um, in the direction of the convexity of the curve. Now, the way I think about these is very similar if they start less than three centimeters, but their trunk is at all shifted towards that convexity. I, I think about them as type Cs and treat them as such, focusing the correction in the lumbosacral fractional curve. As you can see here, even though there was improvement in the lumbar sacral fractional curve, again, um, they went for a home run and tried to correct the mid lumbar curve. Um, and that imbalance of correction resulted in, the in this uh, deformity. So I think these are the patients, <clears throat> the type A's, but also especially the type C's where the kickstand rod is maybe a necessity at times. Um, it's proven utility by multiple groups. 
And I just wanted to run through kind of a step-by-step approach um, for the fellows to understand how my what my technique is. I think there's a lot of different ways, but this is how um, I like to do it. So uh, um, yeah, I usually get an intraoperative coronal alignment, um, long assess the intraoperative alignment with the long film. And then on the ipsilateral side to the de- direction of decompensation. So that if it's a type C, bow type C, you want to put it on the convexity. If it's a very severe type B, then you can put it on the concavity. Um, you place the iliac bolt on that side. Um, then you place two W connectors on the rod um, in the midline around the thoracic lumbar junction, as you can see on the right side there. Um, place the accessory rod between the iliac bolt and the Ws on the right. Um, and then you want to loosen all the set screws on the medial rod, the midline rod that are um, caudal to the W connectors. So you see the green dots here. All these should be uh, loose. You then tighten all the set screws proximal to the W connectors, um, as well as the W connectors set screws on the midline rod. Then you tighten the iliac bolt. Um, you tighten all the contralateral set screws. Um, and you keep open the W connectors on the accessory rod. Um, sorry, I forgot to put green dots on those. Then you put a rod holder on the accessory rod. Um, and then you distract between the Ws and the rod holder. And by distracting there, it then depresses that hemi pelvis. It's a very powerful technique. Um, and again, it can be used on either side depending on your um, direction of, of the curve. A um, couple of pearls. You want to make sure that these rods, the accessory rod is long relative to the Ws, because as you distract, it's going to shorten. And if you start with this length relative to the W connectors and lengthen, then it's going to go you know, past the W or the W is going to go more cranial, and then you won't be able to uh, use that W. Now, the other thing that shortens is the most distal aspect of the midline rod on the iliac bolt midline, so the star at the bottom. So if you keep that short, if it's just protruding through the lateral connector, or if you're doing an S2AI screw directly into the S2AI, and then you distract because the pelvis is being depressed, it's going to push that down and it pushes a screw away from the rod. And then if you don't have enough rod, then you won't be able to get much more distraction. So you want to keep, if you're planning on doing this, um, make sure that that rod is purposely longer than you would normally put it. So that when you depress the hemi pelvis and it shortens relative to the screw head or the lateral connector, then um, you won't get burned and it, you'll still have enough to do your, your correction. So in conclusion, coronal malalignment is common. Disability is driven by greater than three centimeters, three centimeters of residual post-op coronal malalignment. Um, you know, they also have to take into consideration the shoulder heights and their symmetry, um, take into consider leg length discrepancies, and then tailor your surgical strategy to the deformity. Um, so not to belabor the point, but it's an important one. Uh, the bowel type Bs, the OB, OBIE type ones, these are the concave. So the coronal malalignment is ipsilateral to the concavity of the lumbar curve. Go for a home run when you're correcting the lumbar main curve. Um, I had a kickstand rod on the concavity. It's very severe. Um, and then the bow Cs, the OBA type 2s, these are the convex ones. The coronal malalignment is ipsilateral to the convex of the lumbar curve. And then this, uh, for these patients, all of the correction really should go through the lumbosacral fractional curve and add a kickstand rod on the convexity. Um, it will definitely make your uh, life easier and it, it is your friend. I think ultimately you want to balance the correction of the two curves um, and also take into consideration the leg-like discrepancies so you horizontalize, uh, you, you correct to the horizontal and not to the uh, source seals. So thanks for listening and uh, hopefully that wasn't too long or too short, but uh, look forward to anybody's questions. Awesome, Alec. Thank you. Can we open up the field? Any of the fellows in particular have any questions? Hi, um, I'm Amber I'm with San Diego Spine. Um, the, do, do you change the placement of 
not the kickstand rods, but your original rods, does that ever change? Do you choose one side over the other when based on your bow types? Does that have any effect? When or I'm... the tightening of, of those screws or you know, do you know what I'm saying? Like intro. I mean the sequence of placing them, Amber? Yeah. Like, the sequence, for, for yeah. Yeah. For for your bow types. Yeah, that, that's a great question. There is some nuance to that. I think there's a lot of different ways of doing it. One technique that I found beneficial for the tout bow type C's is, or the Obae type twos, if it is because the lumbosacral fractional curve is the main driver, I'll put a short rod on the convexity of the lumbosacral fractional curve, say from L4 to S1 or L3 to S1. I'll then compress there um, because that's going to achieve more lordosis. Then I'll distract, uh, then I'll put the main midline rod on the other side. So on the concavity of the lumbosacral fractional curve, the convex of the main lumbar curve. Then I'll distract on that main midline rod through the convexity of the lumbosacral fractional curve. You're not gonna lose lordosis through L4 to S1 because you've locked the contralateral side. So I'll distract on the concavity of the lumbosacral fractional curve. Once I've then tightened those set screws, then I'll take off that short rod on the convexity of it, then put the main midline rod in. Now, if you are going to use a kickstand rod, then because you have to loosen everything distal, that technique is not, uh, you know, you kind of lose that a little bit, but at least you've locked in that other side. Um, I don't do that for the bow type Bs or the OBI type ones. In those patients, I usually put the main midline rod on the side of the convexity of the main lumbar curve. And the reason for that is when you fix distally in the pelvis and then you cantilever her down, you wanna push down on the convexity of the main lumbar curve. That's gonna help derotate the spine, but it's also gonna help improve the lordosis. I think the kiss of death in the lumbar spine is if you put say the, the, the rod on the concavity of the mid lumbar spine, uh, and then you pull you reduce the lumbar spine to the rod, you're just flattening out the lumbar spine. And that's when you're going to create an atrogenic flat back. So you want to try to push down and cantilever down on the convexity of the main lumbar curve, especially in the uh, OBI type um, type ones or the bow, bow type Bs. Alicos, have you dabbled at all with custom implants? I know we've started to a little bit down here, especially for fractional curves with unique like coronal um, morphology, you know, and they could be pretty powerful. Or have you not really delved into that yet? I haven't jumped on that band bandwagon yet. I'm still trying to understand how those will help in the deformity yeah. world. Um, you know, I think if the goal is to correct the deformity, you don't want to plug the space that's native to the anatomy. Um, I think if you want to create a cage where there may be some asymmetric coronal alignment, so if you're trying to put those bow type C, uh, C's, if you want to put a little bit more of a you know height on the convexity or the concavity to that curve, that would make more sense. But just plug in the space with cages that fit the space, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing on Lexus, which is, we're designing the implants to keep the fractional curve and the bone open. So it kind of works. It doesn't work every time. It's a, it's a work in progress for sure. Nice. Hey guys, uh, this is JC. I got a note from Nima Allen from Barrow. Uh, microphone doesn't work. Can you ask this question? Can you use undersized structural graft via L lift, A lift instead of non structural graft at the level you aim to achieve correction? Uh, it's kind of just a release. Um, yeah, I guess the idea is doing a release with an undersized graph to potentially, you know, prevent the issue that you had just raised with a, you know, patient specific structural graph that may actually block you. Um, I guess the idea here is instead of just a complete release with nothing in that inner, uh, in that disc space, using a smaller uh, cage that will allow for some structural support, but still some mobility. 
yeah, I think that's a, a definitely a very good and viable option. Um, I just two one word of caution is just make sure that there's good, you know, uh, something that can prevent the cage from spitting out. Either you know, placing an integrated screw uh, on one side. I wouldn't put it on both sides because then you'd lock the deformity. Uh, or putting a buttress plate on to prevent the cage from kicking out. Um, you know, there, sometimes these, these uh, when you do a nice release from the front and you can lever, you can have the disc space fish mouth and um, the cage could spit out if the cage is undersized. Cool. Hey, Alekos, it's uh, Venu from uh, Seattle. How are you doing? Um, really, really nice talk. And um, uh, you, you've been doing some really nice cases, it looks like. Uh, my question is the uh, patients who have a normal looking sagittal plane, but a big coronal deformity. I find these are some of the hardest where you're trying to correct the coronal deformity, but you kind of want to leave them exactly where they are in the sagittal plane. And sometimes when we put in the rods to fix the coronal malalignment, we inadvertently overlordose them in the sagittal plane and thus increase the risk of PJK or another issue. Uh, what, do you have any tips on, on those cases? Yeah, that I, yeah, I had run into that a couple of times, Benno. That's a great point. Um, it's definitely, it's nuanced. I think it depends on the coronal deformity. Um, I think that one, taking interoperative image is, is key. I don't think you just do your correction and just visually say that that's sufficient. Um, in those cases, you may want to, um, you know, under contour the rods in the sagittal plane a little bit, um, especially when on the table and you've done your releases in the back or inner bias of the front when they're sagging, it can, um, result in iatrogenic hyperlordosis. Um, it's interesting that we're even bringing that up, but it, it is, it is possible, but yeah, I don't have anything specifically. Those are ones that you just have to pay attention, um, to, both planes, make sure you assess it interoperatively, um, really critique the angles, um, but no real specific, anything you, has worked for you well? Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think what we struggled with is, you know, we actually uh, don't have the ability here to get long cassette x-rays in the OR, you know, believe it or not. And so we're, we're constantly, you know, using fluoro and trying to stitch it together. And, and, and I think, you know, you end up, you, you look at, you know, one isolated x-ray, it looks pretty good. You know, I kind of put your thumb up like this uh, and, and sometimes you can be off when, when, when they stand up. And so I think it's something that we still struggle with. Um, but yeah, uh, I have uh, one thing that I, you know, tip from, you probably already do this as well, uh, uh, is, is often leaving the screws on the concavity long. So if it's a 40 screw, you know, sometimes I'll put in a 55 or a, you know, 60 screw, so that the, I don't have to kind of pull up on the spine or, or, or uh, sorry, if I'm putting in the uh, concave rod, I'll put the concave rod in first. I find if I put in the convex rod, often there's some kyphosis associated with the convexity of the uh, other deformity. And so if I put the, con the convex rod in, often you're pushing down on that part of the spine, which is then going to create more lordosis. So sometimes I'll put in the concave rod first on those uh, concave of the main lumbar curve leave the screws longer than otherwise would be necessary so that I'm not having to pull up on the spine and then take out lordosis. So, um, but like you said, it's nuanced. It really depends on the, on, on the case. Yeah, that's a good, it's cool. I'll make a, I'll make a comment too. So like, if you don't have long films, that's okay. So like in the coronal plane, you can use this called like a T square where you have a, a long rod that's attached to a shorter rod in a 90 degree angle. And you can, with fluoro, stick the horizontal rod right on the acetabulum. And then uh, at a 90 degree angle, you can see all the way up to the cervical spine. So you know interoperatively where you're at relative to that 90 degree axis. Um, you gotta be a little bit careful there, patients like leg length discrepancies, et cetera, because you may not want to correct them to 90 degrees, but those are those are nuances that you can, you can tailor to um, your interoperative assessment. So I use the T-square all the time on the chrome deformities, especially those type A's, because uh, that's where you get screwed. You, you, you look down in the wound, it looks perfect. And then they stand up and they're walking in circles. Um, <laughs> yeah, great. And the that's second thing, point. the sagittal plane, the sagittal plane, you just get a lumbar cassette. And you need the main thing you need in the lumbar spine is just simply your L1 pelvic angle, right? So from L1 to the 
femoral head to the middle of the sacrum. And if your LPA is, is dialed in to where you want it to be, um, from the lumbar spine standpoint, you should be in really good shape. Um, and just to piggyback, I kind of have to know already what kind of spine shape you want to create. And that's where the Rousselie stuff comes in. Just be aware of like the shapes that you're trying to create and that your rod actually mirrors those shapes. Um, there's companies that will help you do that even ahead of surgery. Uh, I've not used them, but I think it makes really good sense. Um, but uh, uh, if you just have a plain film, you can get an LPA with just a regular cassette and a fluoro shot. I mean, and a, and a regular uh, intraoperative x-ray shot. We don't have to have the long cassettes for that one. So anyways, just a few little pearls. Uh, hopefully they help out. Yeah, Great point, Greg. Yeah, but, hey, uh, Alexos, one more question. What yeah. are you doing when you have these patients with significant limb length disparities? I mean, it's easy if they need a hip done and you can have the pelvis leveled, but oftentimes we get these folks with a centimeter or greater. Um, and what are you balancing to? Because that's that's where, for me, the math gets tricky, you know? Yeah, great, great question. So I try to balance to the horizontal. So I'll figure out preoperatively understanding film or an EOS is to look at what how many degrees the uh, what the, the degree of the pelvic obliquity is so draw a horizontal and then draw an angle to uh, the top of the sore seals and if say it's four or five degrees then intraoperatively you try to make your uh, coronal element relative to that um, that's what I've been doing and it, it seems to to be working I remember when Hanjo Kim gave a talk at the UCSF Las Vegas course he said that in Manhattan, if uh, you ask you know a woman to put a, a shoe lift in every pair of her shoes, she's going to be the most unhappy woman. So yeah, exactly. So yeah, you have to avoid you know, relying on a shoe lift. Um, and I think if you horizontal, you know, try to realign them to the horizontal, that should be pretty good. The one thing I don't know is if you do that, you know, and the shoulders are off. Um, then are they going to be as unhappy? And I, that, that part of it, I think I don't have enough experience with, because I imagine if their shoulders are asymmetric, that's also going to be cosmetically not as pleasing. For sure. Greg, Greg, do you have any tips on that? He may be running to the, the OR, Don, because, uh, Oh, sorry. I was on mute. Oh, sorry. No. Uh, so the final comment, um, you got to find out if they're going to have a uh, limb lengthening type of recon. If they're not, then I build their deformity correction to their limb length inequality. Yeah, that's so, what I've been doing. It's, it's an extra step, but, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I've just covered that, great. you know, you start measuring everybody's limb length. There's, there's more people with a significant limb length discrepancy than you probably would originally thought of. And it just becomes one more, you know, number you're trying to, you know, correct for intraoperatively. Yeah. I want to make one more point to Benu. Do you guys have the OR? Hey, sorry, like, because yeah, I was on mute. Um, we do have an OR, we do not yet have the 2D long film capability, however, on the OR, which is something that we are working on. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, and to, to Greg's point earlier, I, lo I love the T-square for the coronal plane. I use it every time. Uh, we have a difficult time even getting lumbar plane films. Uh, Flora is about the best we can do. We need someone's text to come teach our text to shoot yeah. lumbar plane films. Yeah. So. <laughs> then put them down to San Diego afterwards. You're not alone, brother. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the other tool that works really ouch. well is less less ray. If anybody has one of those, JC, I don't know if you guys have that up there, but you can actually stitch the entire spine together, and and all the measurements are are baked into the software. Yeah, no, we've trialed it, but do not have it currently. Well, guys, our fellows got to get to the OR at seven thirteen. Um, I think the fact that we ran over is just emblematic of this being a great topic and uh, one that folks are interested in. So Alec, I was very, very grateful for you putting this together. I think super helpful for me and certainly for our fellows. Um, and we got a great lineup coming up for the rest of the year. So I look forward to seeing you guys next month. Have an awesome weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Alec. Great job, Alec.